Rod and Jens, uh, thank you for an invitation to come here. This, as, as Rod said, this truly is a, a, an amazing opportunity. You've got a, a very solid faculty, including Professor Costwick in the back, who's really a father of, of deformity surgery. And we have an opportunity in the next couple of days to, to see and learn uh, things. I, we've been doing this the last several years. I leave here every year with something new. And the cross-pollination we've talked about before between orthopedics and neurosurgery, you know, this is happening every day. And at some point, we will be one specialty, we will be one spine, and that will happen, I think, during, uh, during our lifetime, certainly, hopefully, within the next few years. Start off with a little drama this morning. We have the sound. Son of a bitch, this isn't working. We're not gonna be able to attach the skull to the neck bone. It will take six screws. Cervical vertebra is fractured on the left side. There's nothing for the screws to hold on to. What about the front of the neck? No. It's got a hairline fracture there, too. The N20 is starting to fade. I don't know how much more of this he can take. What are we going to do? I don't know. You're going to need to attach the skull directly to the spine. What keeps it in place? The titanium loop. Use the wires to secure it to the base of the skull and remove a piece of his rib to fortify it. They've had success with the procedure at Barrow in Phoenix. I observed it at a seminar there last spring. It will work. <laughs> I'm sure that happens in your office. Now, let's be honest here. <laughs> Who's seen this show before? Raise your hand. All right, Rod's the only one who watches nighttime TV. <laughs> so I I'm sure it happens in your operating room. That guy's the hospital administrator. He walks in and tells you how to do the operation. God help us. So we'll, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about occipital cervical fusion and uh, posterior cervical uh, surgery. You know, where a series of x-rays taken in a trauma patient first came in, things looked like they were aligned, and serial x-rays show that this person actually had an occipital cervical dislocation. This is one of the, the injuries that you don't want to miss. This is one of the, the things that gets everybody's attention, because obviously missing that injury, you know, could result in death, and we certainly don't want that to happen. Some disclosures here. Along the way, and I think part of today and part of what we're doing in the lab is an opportunity to really get up close and personal, especially in the cranial cervical junction, but in all areas of the spine, we're going to have an opportunity today to really look at the anatomy, know where everything is. And now ultimately, you know, in a real life setting, that comes before you walk into the operating room. So you have to have an understanding certainly of where everything is. But looking at those preoperative studies in trauma, for instance, looking at patients' CT, CT angiogram, knowing what the anatomy is so you know what to expect, and then also knowing what, where things should be. Patients don't often come, but I don't know why we're behind a slide. It's not uh, advancing here. I see Rod in the back screwing with the slides. Jesus. Hmm. You can, there we go. So obviously patients don't come pre-marked for us here like this, knowing where everything is. So we have to have that understanding. When it comes to the cranial cervical junction, obviously this is, the mo this is our motion segment in the spine. There's the more motion here than anywhere else. Our rotational and flexion extension in the cervical spine all comes uh, by a large part of the cranial cervical junction. Having an understanding of that anatomy becomes critical. What's broken, what's, what's not working? It was a complex series of ligaments attachment, attaching things, uh, and having a little bit of an understanding of what those are and where they are can help us make a diagnosis. It can also help us figure out if that spine is going to be stable and or unstable. Then, and obviously, knowing looking at the anatomy, the surface anatomy of the two joints, both the, both the occipital cervical and the atlantoaxial joints, uh, is both is both critical. As Rod talked about, as we talked about, and Jens just mentioned, you know, looking at the anatomy, of the vertebral artery obviously is something that we l would like to avoid injuring. Obviously, and trauma becomes an issue in patients who have trauma. Again, we're going to get imaging before we'll have a CTA before we'll have an understanding of whether or not they have normal anatomy. Has the vertebral artery been injured? That becomes critical. If you're operating at the cranial cervical junction and you have somebody that only has one vertebral artery, that changes your game plan a little bit. We don't want to be in a situation where we injure the only good. Uh, artery. So that, that becomes an issue. Looking at the, the morphology of the joints between occiput C1 and C1-C2, you realize that the, these are very 
closely coupled joints. Those ligamentous structures keep things in close opposition. In most patients, there's very little asymmetry at all in, in, in uh, the presentation, especially in the coronal plane. We look at between OC1 and C12 and in the sagittal plane, especially at OC1. As you look at those CTs and you start looking at CTs, you realize that those that, that uh, OC1 convex joint and the C1, C2 are very closely opposed. Our motion at C1, C2 is also critical. Obviously, we, t we know that uh, in flexion extension, the occiput uh, cervical junction plays a big role, and then uh, not so much for lateral uh, rotation, but, but some also for bending. And then, of course, at the atlantoaxial junction, that is really uh, provides about 40% or so of our lateral uh, rotation. So that becomes important because patients will ask, well, you're going to do surgery on C1, C2. What does that mean for me? Well, that means that we lose a lot of mobility in our neck. And uh, obviously, if you, if you need to have that operation done, you need to have it done. Patients get concerned about that, but we unfortunately don't have an alternative in fixing that at this point. A lot has been looked at the mechanisms of injury in the occipital cervical junction. What I will tell you is that they're high-speed injuries, okay? These are not uh, injuries that occur uh, with low velocity, usually high speed, and there's a there's a preponderance of these injuries in children, and that has to do a lot with large head size and, and undeveloped musculature in the neck. So we see a lot of children who have uh, problems at the occipital cervical junction for that reason. So as we go through this and figuring out everything, obviously it's important to sort of know because obviously even today we don't know everything and at, at every given day there, there are things. So knowing the literature, knowing what's out there and knowing and reading obviously becomes critically important in all of this. We look at, you know, in the literature it's, it's difficult because if you search it up on PubMed, you occipital atlantal dislocation, cranial cervical dislocation, we can't even come to terms with what the proper terminology is. And the fact of the matter is that all of these things up to and including internal decapitation, which is what the press likes to, to call it. And it sounds very you know, dramatic, the patient was internally decapitated, uh, but that's, that's when they get a hold of it. Historically, interestingly enough, the, the first case was reported in 1908, and really uh, occipital cervical dislocation was felt to be a, a fatal, universally fatal disorder. We saw a lot of it in autopsy, uh, and it was only over the past 30 or 40 years that we started seeing patients who survived this injury. Again, we talked about the reason that, uh, that it's more common in children, really a biomechanical issue. Majority of survivors have really been over the past 15 years. That has to do with better EMS, better stabilization of the patient, and then better imaging. So we're now we're now attuned to this and we can see it. Interestingly enough, just and just to take a small step back historically, you know, the diagnosis was difficult. So when we look back uh, back in 1979, pre-MRI era, Powers talked about uh, this ratio between the base of the skull and C1. X-line method. There were a lot of things that were based on plain x-rays that we would have to make these measurements to see whether or not somebody had OA dislocation. Basilar dens uh, interval, and, and this is this is uh, you know this is pretty good for the most part, but again, none of them had 100% uh, sensitivity, and it was a problem because there were at least 10 different methods or more published in the literature on how on how to make this diagnosis. Condylar gap. Again, on plain x-ray, very difficult uh, to see this. You know, Basilar, uh, the, the, these measurements here, Harris. And again, uh, you know, when you get the radiologist a blue and red pencil and they could start drawing pictures everywhere, it, it became very muddy. We looked at this, you know, Vince Trainellis wrote a, a, a sort of a seminal paper of you know, the orientation. This really sort of is relegated to the history pile as well, because I will tell you that you could see all four of those with four different x-rays in the same patient over the course of a couple hours, and I've seen that. So this is a very highly unstable situation. We talk about which way the spine is dislocated, but the reality is that if things are completely dissociated from one to the other, you may, you may capture all of these. So that really became more of a, of a historical uh, note. Dublin's method, and again, these are, all the, these are all the different lines. Probably the best way to look at this now um, Doc Ling Peng, a pediatric neurosurgeon from Davis, published a beautiful article back in 2007 looking at this condylar C1 interval for OC and making a series of measurements, two or three measurements or four up you know, across that joint and measuring that distance. And he found that by an extra standard deviation, if it was more than four millimeters, it's that, that person has a disruption there. 
What I will tell you is that that, that pretty much is absolute. And if you look at the, like the X-ray or the CT coronal image on the left there, what you see is that there's an asymmetry. So as you're looking at the CT scan, first thing you look for is symmetry. Are things are are they both the same? Because it's in the injuries usually if you've got a, certainly a complete dislocation, it's not going to be dislocated perfectly symmetrically. So there's your first clue. The second clue is that absolute measurement, and in children, uh, it's it's four millimeters. We we just are, we just got accepted for publication uh, an article in adults, and it's about three millimeters in adults. But the bottom line is that that number, you know, again, if you're, if you're getting over that, you, you need to be suspicious. The second you know that uh, you, you've made that diagnosis, that patient needs to be taken out of their cervical collar, and they need to have sandbags placed on the side of their head because the collar, what does it do? It's distracting. So we don't want to have them in a cervical collar. So that's why making this diagnosis becomes important. A couple of years ago, we looked at our experience in occipital uh, atlantal dislocation, just trying to figure out what we could glean uh, from our own series up until 2005, beginning in 1989. And again, we looked at patients who survived and remained stable. So we had about 33 patients, which is a lot. And, and that has a lot to do with the fact that we, in Arizona, we've got long, narrow stretches of highway where the speed limit is posted at 75, but I can tell you that that's not quite the speed limit. And uh, <clears throat> we had 33 patients in this period looking at uh, occipital cervical dislocation. Um, again, look at the mean, 21 years. The youngest patient was, was about seven months. But again, this is a younger age population, high-speed motor vehicle accident. Here's the breakdown between pediatric and adults. And obviously, these patients may have concomitant injuries. I mean, they're not going to come in complaining that, oh, my neck hurts. I think my head has been ripped off. That doesn't usually the case. These patients are very sick. And a lot of them will have concomitant either spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury, which ultimately dictates, the, uh, dictates the, uh, how they do. When you look at outcome, again, about 30% of these patients die. And then you've got some with spinal cord injury and some without. Um, again, the most common was, was the lanoaxial dislocation at 18 out of 33 in the, in the children. And again, uh, about 73% will have some sort of traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury. And, and this, is, this is the breakdown here, not, not to belabor the point, but again, these are, these are very sick patients. So <clears throat> what we concluded the following, and I think that this is where things you know, be, become interesting because again, the issue is how are you gonna treat these patients? You gotta make the diagnosis first. So if you have a normal CT scan and an MRI scan, the MRI becomes very important because the, with the MRI scan, we can actually look at the joints, look for associated injuries, soft tissue injuries. Understand one thing, that MRI cannot diagnose instability. We, we get, people get hung up on that all the time. MRI is a static picture, but what you can see if there's an injury to the joint is fluid in a joint space, other fluid, which will at least get you looking in the right direction. If I slap you hard on the back of the neck and put you in the MRI scan, there will be stir signal changes on the MRI scan in your soft tissues. Well, I slap pretty hard, but the fact of the matter is that that MRI is very sensitive for those soft tissue changes. So the, the bottom line is it, it's, a, there, it's a marriage between those two. And then add in MRA. So this is really where the, the rubber hits the road. So CT is, not, is, you know, is, is great. It will give us, it will point, MRI gives us additional, additional information, MRA or CTA also gives us additional information on the vessels. So in those patients who had a normal CT scan and maybe some mild changes, those are patients you can probably get away with treating with an external orthosis if you're really concerned putting them in a halo. If they have distraction on a CT, in other words, that joint space is compromised, you know, or grossly abnormal MRI scan, those are the patients which we, we put into the surgical group. And I know we had a great discussion last year uh, with Jens Chapman, who uh, published a great series at University of Washington, actually in, in surgery, sort of making the diagnosis uh, to confirm it by pulling on the patient's head. They're, they're a lot ballsier than we are, so we didn't, we never, never done that. So again, the best predictor of outcome in these patients really is how they come in with respect to the neurologic injuries. And, and as I said before, using CT and MRI as complementary studies. So what do the guidelines tell us? So, you know, a couple of years ago, we published the ANSCNS guidelines on management of acute spinal cord injury. And uh, what's now level one evidence is from Pang's article looking at the cranial cervical index in children using that as the measurement. And uh, again, other than that, we're not going to have class one evidence uh, for most of what we do in spine surgery for, for quite some time, if ever. And um, 
you know, if there's clinical radio, uh, radiographic diagnosis, then you know, obviously using these other complementary imaging studies. But again, using as we showed the the, uh, the uh, cranial cervical index uh, in children greater than four millimeters being abnormal. What else is level one? It, this is great. Traction is not recommended. Okay, so. God help you if you don't realize this, and we teach residents this all the time. Traction is a phenomenal and phenomenally powerful way to get somebody in spinal alignment with ongoing compression, bilateral lock facets, fracture dislocations. Traction, if you're not using it, obviously, is in the meat can, can very quickly restore normal alignment and get pressure off the spinal cord. You do not ever want to miss, obviously, an injury to the cranial cervical junction because that becomes a lethal maneuver. We've, we finally were able to move that up to level one. It was level three before, but, uh, you know. So <clears throat> this is from our lab in Phoenix biomechanically. We do a lot of fun things like ripping spines off skulls. So you see what's happening here. C1 and C2 are coming apart. And interestingly enough, this, is, this goes back to the anatomy at the cranial cervical junction. This has to do with the apical ligament. The apical ligament is that ligament which connects the tip of the dens to the base of the clivus. If you've got a strong and well-formed apical ligament, you're probably going to get a distraction at C1-2. And some cadavers and some patients have a, a not fully formed occipital or apical ligament. Those patients tend to present with occipital lanal dislocation. So really that apical ligament is what was key. That little thing here. Next time you look at an MRI of the cranial cervical junction, start looking because you'll see that apical ligament in some patients. And again, it's just, so there are things that we can see on MRI scan that as you start looking uh, become critical. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk a little bit about occipital cervical fusion. You know, attaching the base of the skull uh, to the upper cervical spine. The base of the skull is great because you've got thick heel. Again, look at your imaging. When you're doing any of these operations, you can look at the CT scan, because they've all had a CT of the head for the most part. Start making some measurements on the, on the sagittal images. How thick is the midline keel? And if you're using image guidance, that you know that that becomes helpful as well. Where is the the you know the maximal thickness so that you know what type of screws to put in? There's been a lot of uh, biomechanical data in the literature regarding what is the ideal construct. Well, the ideal construct I'll tell you right now is one which hold, holds things together long enough for the bony fusion to occur. So this is an area where you have to have a bone graft. We'll talk about that in a minute, but this is, you, you're not just putting screws and rods in, and you're not just laying in some demineralized bone matrix. You have to have a structural graft, and we'll talk about that. But these rigidities of these constructs really become meaningless if, 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 you, get, if you get a bony fusion. So, so if one's a little bit stronger than the other, that's fine, but again, it's a biological uh, issue. In all these cranial cervical things, you'll see, and we'll see it in the lab today, you have to have a plan and a bailout plan. You're going to get a patient with soft bone. You're going to get some abnormal anatomy. You may get a vertebral artery injury. Whatever the case that happens at surgery, you have to, in your mind, be thinking, okay, what am I, what am I setting out to do, and what happens if it doesn't work out? So you got to have your MacGyver stuff going on. And you see the, the last thing, obviously, have diapers. So, you know, this really started off with very rudimentary uh, fixation. And this is the, the threaded Steinman pin, which we would actually bend on the back table. And to the patient's anatomy, I'd take an endotracheal tube stylet, bend a loop, and then bend a secondary loop here, conforming that to the patient's anatomy. Still do this in children. And the reason is that if you're under the age of three, the youngest child that we have done occipital cervical fusion with screws is three. The youngest reported case in the literature, I think, is two. But the fact is that if you're you know, younger than that or if the child has some sort of syndrome, morchios, or some other spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, you may not be able to put lateral mass screws in. You may be relegated to this. And this is an amazingly robust construct, drilling holes through the skull, sublaminar wires, and wiring this, this uh, cable. And again, augmenting that with a, uh, uh, a, a bone graft. So that's, that's, that is one thing, and I'll show you a video of that. So possible sites for C2, this is where things get interesting. We'll, we'll look at this in the lab. And there's a lot of talk. This, this, by far and away, the, the yellow screw, the, the uh, PAR screw is the most common and, and most anatomically predictable screw. Pedicle screw, you can put a longer screw in, but the trajectory is more medial, and you have to be a lot more lateral. The problem with the occipital cervical junction, as you'll see in the lab, is you're putting screws in. If you've got one screw at C1 here and one screw at C2 over here and one screw at C3 here, 
you're going to be really unhappy because you've got a rod and you're going to be sitting there bending a rod for about six hours trying to get things to line up and it, it just doesn't end well. So thinking in your mind again, what are you doing and what's your best way? So you, you want to get the best bony purchase, but you also want, want to make sure things line up because you don't want to have to be struggling. And you know, you look at the x-ray and you're, you, you know, you get the rod in there and then people are looking at the x-ray and you see a rod that has a, has a Z confirmation in it and your radiologist is sort of raising his eyebrows and so lateral mass screws, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, but the fact of the matter is these are the workhorse for the subaxial spine. So you've got to be very familiar with putting in lateral mass screws. And in the, in the aging patient as well, getting a picture in your mind of, of that anatomy because it doesn't look like this. And you've got a 75-year-old guy with rheumatoid arthritis. They don't look like this. The joints don't look like this. So again, seeing in the lab, looking at that, Where's the inferior facet? Where's the joint capsule? Where's the lateral extent? Knowing what the safe zone to put screws in. And we'll talk about that in the lab. Ideally, you've got this. You've got a situation where you've got firm fixation to the skull, to the upper cervical spine with a bone graft. Again, you know, at the end of the day, you've, you're, we're all looking to have this, uh, to have uh, things heal. A couple of things were around sort of a flash in the pan. Uh, Curtis Dickman, one of my partners, uh, published a case, and there was a, uh, a couple of other cases in the literature of a occipital cervical uh, screw fixation. The, the problem with this is if there's a distraction, you really can't do this. So you have to get things well opposed. So if somebody has that ligamentous injury and you've got that, that ball and cup perfect, then you can do this. Image guidance is also critical because this is not a situation where you're really doing it blindly. And, you know, airing one side or the other will put you in the hypoglossal canal and there are a lot of other issues that you can get into. It's great from a, from a biomechanical standpoint, not easy to do. There's a patient uh, that, that we did, and again, there's a bone graft wired to the base of the skull. Isolated occipital cervical injury with just OC1 fixation. Um, again, it's... it's uh, you know, this, these cases are rare, and we, don't, we, you know, we haven't really done a lot of these just because this is that, that exact presentation is not common. Anatomy, and then, of course, again, the, the extent of distraction. Are those black screws? Well, they're, they're not. They're cannulated. They're the same screws you use for an odontoid screw. You could put a lag screw in, but the problem with the lag screw is you want to have some screw purchase across the joint. The lag screw is a larger, you know, diameter bore, and then maybe a smooth shank at the end, so you probably wouldn't want to use that. So you'd probably want to use a fully threaded screw, which is what we did. But um, again, it's these are you know these are sort of really just for just for for discussions. I'm gonna now just show you a few case examples, and we'll look at some of the some strategies for some some common and sort of more uncommon uh, pathologies. So here's a patient with occipital cervical dislocation. There's no question here. Even Rod in the back of the room who's checking his stocks will tell you that there's a distraction here. I know as he looks up from his computer to here, and there's a huge separation there. There's, you see that from across the room. But again, on an x-ray, somebody comes in a trauma room, these are things that get missed. Somebody comes in obviously with another injury with a spleen or something else. You know, they get the, they rush them through CT scan, or sometimes we'll get the call. They're in the operating room taking a spleen out, and, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, we got an occipital cervical injury." You don't want to again. You don't want to miss this. And once you've identified that, that patient requires your immediate attention and exacting care, taking him out of the collar, and I'll actually literally gently push on the head a little bit, and then tape them in that position so they're not you're not distracting them. But there's no doubt here that uh, this is what you're dealing with. C1, C2 looks a little uh, wide as well. This is a 17-year-old male. Uh, put them in a halo. And again, this is the one, this is the case that, that because of this, we were able to get occiput C1 screws in. Done with image guidance. And again, with the halo, we're able to reduce them. In the post-reduction, we're able to see that things were well aligned. And that and that's difficult because again, it's a you know, it's a ball and cup. And if just pushing on it sometimes, and if you're completely distracted, you're not gonna get things to line up. But if you did, and and uh, and you you can do this. So this is definitely an option. This is just showing you here the relevant anatomy of the screw. And again, this is really best done with image guidance for a few reasons, at least of which is not as it can be difficult to see on a plain x-ray during surgery whether or not that trajectory is okay. You can also make a measurement on the fly with your, 
uh, with image guidance about how long your screw is going to be. Because again, you, you drill with the K wire, you don't know where the other tip of that of that screw is. The nice thing about this fixation is that you you spare C1, C2. So if indeed the patient has an isolated OC1 injury, you don't have to go down to, to C1, 2 so they, they, you spare that rotation. Sometimes that's not possible. A lot of patients will have C1, uh, C1, C2 pathology as well. So this is a woman we, we saw a few years ago who had fairly significant bilateral occipital condyle fractures. And again, you know, some would say, well, you might be able to treat that in a halo. Well, on the right side here, you've got a significant displacement of uh, so, yeah, you can, um, let me show you the, the picture here, Adam. Probably the best scene on the plane x-ray here. So, bone graft with, you drill a hole in the skull and, and, and uh, around through C1. And then basically, you know, you're putting it under tension by, by doing that. After the screws are in, obviously, so you've immobilized that joint. But, but to Dr. Kander's point, you've got to have bone graft. So this, you just put those screws in, you're, I mean, this is going to fall apart and fail. So, and, and ultimately, you have to have something to attach it to. This is where it gets a little tricky because most of the constructs, you can attach it through the rod or wire things down to your existing hardware. Here, you've got two screws here. So you're really relegated to having a piece of bone which has to fit perfectly between the oxbow and C1 and then wire that in. And that can be done through a burr hole and then through the foramen magnum and in in around C1. Taking a wire and tensioning a wire between the oxbow and C1 could be lethal as well. So that's why the screws go in first. So you want to immobilize that segment first and then worry about your bone graft. But, but you know, it's a tenuous situation, and again, we, we did some total of two of these cases, and it, we haven't done it for a while. It's just, again, it's a, it's a lot of work. It looks great, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a, they're, they're not easy cases. And, and they really require perfect reduction before. And if somebody has a significant dislocation, that's just not going to happen. So this is a woman who had significant bilateral occipital condyle fractures with disruption of the joint. This is a bony injury. If you, you know, you theoretically could try, if you get things aligned, occipital condyle fractures, unilateral, usually heal without any problem at all. Bilateral become more of an issue and bilateral with displacement become another issue as well. And you see here, you've got a significant displacement. One side's pretty well aligned, but you see a sort of an asymmetry in the OC1 junction. The other side's more markedly uh, compressed. So, Here's your question, we, again, similar to that last case, you'd like to be able to just fix occiput C1 and not, and not have to go up to C2. Um, and again, you, this patient also had a clivus fracture, so the tip of the clivus is fractured, so you know for sure that the, the apical ligament, if, if there was one that, that was robust, is involved as well. And the MRI scan here, you see that fluid that we talked about uh, in the joint space. And that's what you're looking at, the stir signal that should be relatively dark on, on the stir sequences. When you see flu there, you realize that, that either there's stretch or some or an injury that's more significant. Again, not hanging your hat on the fact that that's the, that, that is a diagnostic because if your numbers are okay, if your CT looks perfect and you see this, you say that there's been some sort of strain but not necessarily a, a complete dislocation. And here's what we did, and this was we published this as well. This is my case. is really one of the first cases of just OC1 fixation. And this is back when I was uh, taking hip graft. You see a piece of a graft there, again, between the occiput and C1. That's where the carpentry comes in, and that's where the wiring uh, comes in. How many people are, are comfortable wiring bone grafts in? So do we have wire rod? Last year we didn't. Anyway, well, we can talk about it at the craniocervical uh, table. Doc, uh, you know, the, the, fact of the, the fact of the matter is that is really one of the, the areas where that becomes a, a really per, int, you know, excellent adjunct for what we do, being able to take a cable and, and wire in a bone graft. So it's really something you need to learn how to do at some point. Um, but here you've got great skull fixation. You have C1 and a bone graft here, and you've spared, you've spared her. Uh, this woman C12, she went on to heal well there, and again, you know, preserve C1 C2 fixation. So a nice way to do that. This this is a little girl with spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. Uh, she had a note which said she was not supposed to go to PE, but she ran outside. Some girl pushed her down the slide, and she came in with uh, you know, basically transient quadriparesis. 
And you're looking at this film, and you see these these this are these are the the syndromic problems, this problems we see in these children, with, with, especially with spine below epiphyseal dysplasia, very abnormal cervical spine. So the well-meaning you know emergency room doctors, well, we get flexion extension X-rays, you know, in acute setting. I'm like, I'm looking at this going, <gasps> so look at that OC1. <laughs> And you get a CT scan and you see why. So she has this chronic ununited fracture of C2. You see this orthotopic fragment at the tip of C2, which is fused to C1. And then you're looking at that going, well, that, that can't be good. She's got significant stenosis there. And you look at the MRI scan, you realize why. So she's now lying down on the MRI scan and things are well aligned, but you can see T2 signal change in the, in the spinal cord there. And you can see sort of a chronic problem there. So this is, this is a problem that needs to be fixed. This child is this tall. And the fact of the matter is that you, uh, your options are limited. You're not putting screws in this bone, I can tell you right now, nor are you, you know, getting a, any sort of normal fixation in the lateral masses. So this is just a quick video just to show you uh, the procedure. Once everything is open, we'll, we'll start finding the sublaminar space so that we can pass wires. This is the endotracheal tube stylet. The endotracheal tube stylet I'll borrow from my anesthesiologist and basically make that curve so I have in my hand what that what I want the rod to look like. So then I can then go to the back table and cut a rod and fashion it to the patient's anatomy. So this is making your own hardware. The, 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 with all due respect to our fantastic vendors, they don't want you making your own hardware. But the fact of the matter is that in these cases you have to. So it becomes a little bit like wire soup because what we've done now is pass sublaminar cables at C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and also uh, to the base of the skull. There's the rod going in. Once the perfect the surface has been exposed, you've got this, and then you're going to start tensioning the wires opposite each other, bringing that loop into perfect apposition with the cranial cervical junction, okay? Because this is all about carpentry. Putting screws in is great, but this is really, this is the craftsmanship now of, of being able to attach this, this child's head. Because again, you're not, you know, there's not a lot of great options for these kids, especially with this, uh, with, uh, you know, being a dwarf and having the anatomy that they have. The larger things you see are, are were temporary fixations that we're drilling off we're decorticating, and uh, ultimately we'll, we'll wire the bone graft in. And there it is, right there. The, the really the best bone is the rib. Okay, so I've not, and I've not taken hip graft for the last ten years. The rib is nice because that curvature lends itself to the occipital cervical junction. You can take a piece of rib and it'll fit perfectly in there. There's your post-operative X-rays. Yeah. For any reason, it's just it's it's just too painful for me and for the patient. And, you know, and I learned I learned as a resident I call and we did we were using it for we used to routinely use anterior hip grafts for ACD. And I remember calling for a, a research paper, 300 patients who had allograft bone, of course none of whom had hip pain, and about 22 percent of the the neck patients. Oh, my neck pain's better, but I still have hip pain at a year after surgery. So it's it's very painful. It's a beautiful bone. Really, is in in a young healthy patient. Really, is the best thing. But you know, we have to weigh those risks against the biology of the situation, how they're going to heal if we do something else. And if you use a piece of allograft bone, 99% of the time they're going to fuse anyway in the anterior cervical spine. Posteriorly, you know, again, that's another painful iteration. Is taking a big graft. A piece of rib is well tolerated. When the patient's lying prone, you'll find their scapula. I take the rib right below the scapula. A couple of years ago, when I was in the operating room, and a resident says, okay, here, here this is a really large rib. Go, Gee, that's interesting. That's the scapula. <laughs> so make sure when the patient's prone that you feel their scapula, mark the scapula, and then you make an incision below that. We were able to use the same incision and get a piece of rib, but I'm like, Jesus Christ, what are we looking at here? So, so this is the world's largest rib. So make sure that you're make sure that you're making it over the rib. That that's an embarrassing situation. So harvesting that piece of rib is is relatively straightforward. We can do that in the cadaver too. But basically stripping off the neurovascular bundle, taking a piece about six or seven centimeters, and again, that curvature God made for the occipital cervical junction. This is postoperatively, again, uh, you know, you see the structural graph coming up here. And she did great. This is her, but look at this neck. She has no, no, uh, no neck to begin with. And interesting in children, even with occipital cervical fusion, 
they do get some compensatory motion back. So she's, she's actually doing very well. The, you know, once again, it's, and we'll talk about this in, in a minute, positioning is key in these patients. This is, a, this is a case from a few years ago. This is a girl who was joking around with her sister and she ends up having neck pain and she comes in the emergency room and she's, her head's like this and, and her, her ears off to one side and the emergency room doctor says well, she's got occipital or lanoaxial rotatory subluxation. So C1 and C2 are sort of locked into that configuration. So neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon comes in, realigns her head, puts her in a collar. A couple weeks later, her head goes back. They do it a second time, she goes out, it goes back again, and this time they just let her be. And that's a problem, because if you have a fixed C1, C2 deformity, this is the way you are. And in a child, as the spine's developing, the problem is, even the weight of the head is gonna cause a deformity, and you're gonna end up fusing C2, 3, and then you're gonna end up like this. And if you play the violin, that's fine, but if you don't, that's a problem. So. If you look at her CT scan, you see that we're, we're getting into a problem. So she's left this way, and what happens now? Now C1 and C2 are fused that way. That's a problem. And not only are they fused that way, but you see that, that, that she's being, becoming drawn down. And you can see her head tilt here. And this becomes a situation now which, again, if left untreated, is going to lead to a severe deformity. So here she is pre-op. She's got axial rotation still, again, you know, not, not from C1, C2, because they're fused, but the fact of the matter is she's, she's young. At this age, I think, she's, I think she's eight or 10, I don't know what the... So, difficult problem. In this case, we, we chose to treat it in a two-stage approach, and that first stage was doing a transoral approach to drill that bar out, because she's fused at C1 and C2. We have to be able to release that to get her head in a perfect position. So we did, we did a transoral and we did, again, with image guidance, is able to get through that bony bar to disarticulate C1 and C2 so that we could then position her head because otherwise you're positioning against what? Your head's fixed like that. So we were able to do that and then basically in, had her in a halo, flipped her into the prone position. You see the rib, there's the scapula. Make your incision below the scapula. And again, um, you know, and this is just the, the two seconds to talk about bone graft. As I said, you have to, you, you've got to have bone at the occipital, whether it's C1, C2, OC1, OC2, you've got to have structural bone. I've seen, I can't tell you how many failure cases I've seen in my practice sent from outside, uh, you know, a couple of my own where things didn't heal, where that, where if the bone doesn't incorporate, that's an enormous amount of stress on those little screws and rods, and they will break. So you've got, to, you've got to do things perfectly and you want to get things in line. And there's the, there's the bone graft. The, you know, this is her uh, in surgery. I, I, take, I took the, bo the, the rib, bisected it, so we've got rib on both sides now between the occiput. When you're putting your plate on, no, don't put it right down at the frame and magnet, move it up so you've got a window, a channel of bone to, uh, to fixate. And uh, again, you can wire everything in. Here we are again after surgery. There's the there's the rib. Here she is in her halo. We left her in a halo for just for a week or two. I, would, I wouldn't do that anymore. Look at the look at the amount of flexion extension you get. Even if if I did this operation on an adult, the patient's walking around. They're not. They've lost everything. In a child, there is a significant amount of compensatory motion that they have. So this is her eight or nine years ago. She's now a student at ASU and uh, doing well. <laughs> I'm gonna, I need my Zantac now. This, this kid was sent from outside. He's a 31 year old kid with progressive juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. He's got this kyphotic neck deformity. His, he lies in bed, he plays Xbox, and his mom says that he cannot hit the shoot button on the Xbox. This is what's bringing him in. I'm like, okay, is that, is that critical? I've got two boys, I can't rip them away from the Xbox. I mean, is that, is that really crucial? I'm looking at this going, so he had an operation done many years ago, and you can see the old uh, construct here. The, you know, these old plates had holes in them, and you'd put screws in. So we weren't doing rods and screws. We had these plates with rods. You see one long screw here. You see some wires. I'm like, okay, well, let's get a CAT scan. I'm like, oh, God. So he's got a beautiful occipital cervical fusion, but he's got a subaxial disaster now, uh, and, you know, in a, in a chronic... So uh, we get the MRI if you want to feel even worse. Uh, 
And I'm looking at this, and we're, then we're looking at the vessels. I'm like, okay, well, oh, and by the way, they had a vertebral artery injury on one side, and the other side, they have a pseudoaneurysm. So you really can't put together a worse situation than that, because ultimately, you really have to be careful. This is where knowing everything ahead of time is going to be important. Because again, if you don't know the vascular anatomy and you injure the right vertebral artery, you've killed somebody, potentially. And the fact is that... Uh, you know, knowing this is important. My endovascular guys looked at it and they're like, uh, yeah, we're not gonna touch that. So thankfully for that, we were able to get in and again with image guidance, get things reduced. Left his old construct, you know, the skull stuff in it because he had a solid bony fusion there. So don't make more work for yourself. But again, this is where this is where putting things together and, and adding and subtracting become important. Got him reduced in surgery and decompressed, and then we're able to extend the fusion. This is a, this is, a, this was, you know, started out to be a simple case and, and turned out to be more of a tragedy and then ultimately ended up okay. This is a 17 year old kid, had headaches and some numbness. Then when his friend jumped on his back, he seemed to have a, a Chiari malformation uh, with platabasia. So this is, this is a, again, treated elsewhere. And you see there's probably more going on than meets the eye. So you look at this, you go, oh, so the surgeon thought, he's got a Chiari. We'll take care, we can take care of that. Well, he does have a Chiari, but he also has a, about a 90 degree clavoaxial angle. That should be about 135 degrees minimum. So, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that that's, that's a problem. And what's gonna happen when you just do a Chiari and you take away the posterior tension band, that's not gonna end well. So it did, and that was the first operation. So, Again, I don't know why, but the thought process, well, when you started failing, we'll just do OC1 fusion. And the problem is that that's part of the problem. So we, we do that, and he really doesn't get better. He ends up getting worse, and he still has this sort of ventral compression that we saw here from this. So he does a transoral, and again, symptoms got a little bit better, didn't get better. He does okay for a few months. He's got some bronchitis, and now look what's happening now. He's, he still has really the same problem. You've got this thing, and this is after a sort of a transoral, and you now further destabilizing the junction there. Now you've got this, this piece of bone there. This is after the second operation here, again. So the tip of the, the, the odontoid's gone, the bone graft is here, but he's continuing to fail. Look, look here, look at this. So he takes him back and does a repeat, you know, uh, transoral after the third operation and we're now we're left a little bit better but still compression and uh, again close up here still with brainstem compression so he comes in literally flown in from Texas in extremis and I'm talking to this poor kid of 17 and he ends up I had to intubate him during the during the intake interview because he can't he can't uh, sustain his respirations He's, uh, he's got, you know, gross weakness in his arms and legs and, uh, you know, essentially dying from brainstem compression. For us. And it's, it, that's, we don't want, want that to happen. So at this point we said, okay, well, well what can we do? We had these transrolls. We need to get them aligned. We need to take out that hardware, which was just a wire loop, really definitively decompress the posterior fossa with a craniectomy, C12 laminectomy. Went in and actually resected the tonsils. Again, you've got this. He does have large uh, cerebellar tonsils. They're in the way. Let's let's. I don't want to ever have to go back on this this kid again. We went in and, and resected the tonsils, lysed those adhesions because again those tonsils were now plastered to the brainstem. Put a patch in and then get him into alignment and fuse him uh, down to down to a uh, lower level here at this point C5. And this is this is what we ended up with. And. Um, he ended up actually uh, going to rehab a few days after surgery and really made really a remarkable recovery. Uh, here's post-operatively. Now you see that there's still this ventral thing here, but it's not, you've got room around the brainstem here. Hydrocephalus is gone and went on to graduate high school. It's, uh, you know, again, noticing things that from the beginning and, and to be honest with you we all make mistakes and and but looking at that cranial cervical junction before probably could have spared you this and now we're seeing these people who have chiari which isn't really a chiari now we're realizing that they have some sort of cranial cervical junction abnormality How often do you see that? so yeah 
A little bit. And now, unfortunately, we're also seeing these Ehlers Donlos patients, which is, we can talk about for lunch. But there's this, you know, there, there, it, it definitely occurs, and you'll see patients who will have some cranial cervical junction, whether it's just the clavulaxial angle, which is completely flat, or have some sort of OC1 problem, you know, hypo, hypoplastic condyle on one side, other things like that where I think if you do, and especially in the, in the children more common, you're going to pick it up because they usually have more problems early on. In the adults, less so. But again, it's just, it's just being aware. Right. It's about five to ten percent of Chiari failures are because of an abnormal clival axial angle. Sure. And um, Fraser Henderson published a really nice paper about right. this, and um, Ed Benzel was on that paper. Alex Vaccaro was on that paper, talking about you know a, a clival axial angle that's less than 145 degrees being right. a risk factor for this. But I have had a very very difficult time pulling myself to actually forging ahead with a fusion in these patients. Well, you're, but you're seeing the failures, right? And you're treating them with the fusion. So the, but you bring up an excellent point. I think something we have to consider. And I think that, you know, when you do have that flat angle there, the question is, is that really truly what we call Chiari or is it that, is it that inclination that's causing the, to look like a Chiari? Is it really more of a pseudo Chiari? And that's, that's really what it comes down to. You're right. It's, you know, somebody has this constellation of symptoms and you want to treat them for a Chiari, which is a relatively straightforward, fun operation, turning into a disaster like this case. I mean, that's that's where I don't think we know we have enough data to, to support. But this, it's definitely an interesting topic. I agree. Um, positioning really is key. That's me lying on my back, you know, and I'll tell you, here's the issue. When you're positioning a patient for occipital cervical fusion, you're, that's it. That is your chance to make this thing right. If you fuse somebody looking too far up or too far down, it is a disaster. And again, unfortunately in my practice, I've seen patients who come in, fused like this, you know, or fused up like this, and there are problems with both of them. Fused down too far, and the patients who came in who literally have a feeding tube because they can't swallow, because they're, they're almost like a chin on chest. Too far up, they can't participate in life because they're, you know, looking up in the clouds. <laughs> the, the, you know, so you're, you're on your back, you're there, we're under the table, and, and we spend 15 to 20 minutes at the beginning of the case making sure that head's perfect. Where, what's, the, what's the space between the chin and the chest? Here's a clue. Look at the patient before surgery. Okay, if it's a trauma, and a, a trauma is easy because you want to just put their head in a neutral position. But in these syndromic kids, how are they? I had one kid who had uh, Morchios who, who slept on his stomach with his neck extended. So you have to know what they look like before surgery, like that little girl, have an idea so that you know what you're going to be doing and fixing that in, in that position. So a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of care taken, uh, again, and they're looking at that chin on chest and figuring out how you're going to fix this patient. This is a couple quick, one last case or two last cases. This is an 11-year-old girl with Treacher Collins and some clipophile file problems, multiple sort of cervical anomalies in her neck. You can see this. So interestingly enough, she had something that was sort of uh, cool I hadn't seen before, which was a, a non-union of the, C, the, a, the ring of C1, both anterior and posterior. So you've really got this enormous lever arm here. You're going to talk about a pumpkin on a stick. And then you've got C1 and C2 with... Uh, or C1, I should say, that's completely not formed here. So the ring of C1 is open in the front of the back. And, and when she flexed, she started developing myelopathy just from her head movement. So this is a situation where, again, you probably want to fixate this. She's losing function. Not a, I mean, not a lot to work with here. Here's your, C, your x-ray showing the separation here with movement. So we did something, again, we hadn't done before, which is diffuse her to her scapula. And here the scapula becomes a recurring theme in my talk. but. Her scapula, she's the spring, this deformity where her scapula was up at C2. So we're looking at this bone, and I go, there's a perfect place to anchor a screw. Yeah, it's her scapula. So again, since she's fused subaxial all the way down to her thoracic spine, you can do that. And there's what we did. And there's, there's scapula up here, and then there's the bone graft again fashioned into the occipital cervical junction. And she did quite well. Here's a three-year-old. This is this just very 
cathartic to, to Dave Aconquo's point. This is a kid who had a big Chiari and, you know, again, missing the fact that this, that, uh, this person has has got a problem here. Started having brainstem compression instability. This this child had multiple congenital problems. And here's the here's the construct here. Uh, we want, had again sort of a loop with a wire a screw construct and uh, wiring up into the skull. Interestingly, at C1 it had a little bit of bleeding, and this is your worst nightmare. And we didn't you know we said well we probably had a breach. Uh, we were using image guidance, but very small anatomy. And of course, the child wakes up with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And sure enough, not here where the screw is, but up at the cranial cervical junction, or at the tubal basal junction, I should say, ended up with a pseudoaneurysm, which then exploded during coiling. And you know, this child ended up devastated after that operation. And you know, I remember this child to this day. Here's the brainstem here. One vertebral artery, and it, it wasn't. We didn't penetrate the vertebral artery because we didn't really have any bleeding. But what had happened was the screw thread caught the vertebral artery, and as we're putting the screw in at C1, it pulled the vertebral artery. Because why else would you have a dissection up at the, you know, uh, vertebral basal junction? That's exactly what happened. So this, these are high stakes cases. I mean, this child, unfortunately, we didn't have an option. Had a huge head Chiari decompression, head falling off, and you know, becoming quadriplegic. Don't don't really have an option. And that's uh, so. These are you know these are sobering cases, and it really uh, lends you know makes us aware of what we do is very can be very dangerous. The, the rheumatoid case. Very quickly, just uh, this is also sent from outside. This is great because look at the po post-op CT in this patient. Everything looks fine, and the guy comes in with neck pain. He's feeling this clicking, and here's his post-op. Hmm, what's wrong? Well, guess what? What's missing here? <laughs> He had three screws in a row here, and now there's only one. And here they are, <laughs> right here. So again, if things aren't, you know, you, you've got a chance in the skull, and this, those occipital keel skull screws are probably the strongest screws that we put in the body. You've really, you know, getting bicortical, I, I used to think wasn't, wasn't critical. I now try to do that um, just because it gives us better purchase, but we we're able to salvage that by putting additional screws in and, and refixating them. So in conclusion, Know your anatomy. We'll have a chance to look at that in the lab. We've got phenomenal faculty here. Know some biomechanics about the, about the junction. Know what you're going to do. Know a little bit about what's in the literature. Positioning is key. Figuring out what you're going to do beforehand, obviously, and then and then uh, and then bone grafting strategies, and then and following up with your patients to see how they do. So, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Rod for the invitation to speak and entertain any questions if there are any. Mm -hmm.